Well, good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. Before I get going, let me just take a moment and pray. God, may we be aware of you in new ways today. And I ask that you would speak to us. I'd ask that you would challenge us, but I also would ask that you would comfort us. So show us things, God, that need your healing touch this morning. And as we leave this place, may we know that you are in the process of restoring us. Speak into our souls that we may hear your voice. And make these passages clear that we may find our healing and hope. And we know that you will be with us as you always are. And may everything thought and everything spoken and everything felt be blessed by you. Amen. We live in a broken world. And it didn't just break recently. That song that you heard was written in 1964 by Simon and Garfunkel, The Sound of Silence, which Disturbed, if you're on TikTok, has done a wonderful rendition of it. However, when that song first came out, the meaning behind it was a song about the inability of people to communicate with each other. Sixty years ago, I still think we have the same problem today. It's this broken world we live in, and I'm not sure that too many people would argue against my statement. Most people I actually believe would agree that with all the injustice, the crime, the sickness, the disease, the war, our world is broken and it needs some serious fixing. But the question comes down to how do we fix this? Because we live in a unique time today. With the technological advances we see in our world, there are probably some who think, well, look at, we can fix everything through technology. After all, what... What is much of the push today with technology? It's, it's basically helping people be better. And if we think about it, we have watches that keep track of our fitness levels. We have phones that organize our daily routines for us. We have social media that tracks what we look at, who we are, our age, our gender, our ethnicity, etc. And it puts things out there for us to see you know, uh, that maybe we, it could inspire us to live better lives. And now we add to that the rapid development of AI to make life easier for all of us, right? AI, chat GPT, please write a paper on eschatology. It has to be 18 pages long. And, 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 and I, I mean, really, the goal of technology, and I love technology, but the goal of technology is helping people be better, better people. And there's, there's nothing wrong with this. Don't get me wrong, but there's a danger that we could buy into the thinking that the world will be fixed with our technological advances. We can have better air quality by having smart electric vehicles that don't put toxins in the air, but I like trucks. <clears throat> we can live healthier lives by letting devices tell us what to eat what not to eat, when to eat, how much to eat. You know, and when you think about it, technology dictates so much of our lives. Now, again, I'm not trying to discourage the use of technology. I use it a lot myself. My notes are on an iPad, for goodness sake. But my point is, is that we have to be careful that we don't fall into thinking that somehow man's advancements to try to make the world a better place is going to work. It may make it easier for us to live in this world, but ultimately the world is still broken. And even AI gets it wrong sometimes. It better be God. <laughs> Remember we used to boo when you used to that? When we first started Soul and cell phones were the rage and people would come into church and their phones would go off, the entire community would hear the phone go off and everybody would... <laughs> Maybe we got to get back to that again, huh? That'd be fun. The world is broken because of sin. And the only way that it was, is overcome is from the blood of Jesus. 
And we can never look at this too much or overemphasize this too often. We sang it so much this morning. Jesus came into a broken world. He lived a perfect life, and he gave up that life to die on a cross to fix what was broken. Jesus conquered the grave and the issue of death by taking up his life again in the resurrection. And all those who believe in Jesus will have eternal life with God. That's the message. And this world is broken, but Jesus offers the remedy for our brokenness himself. He was broken for us. In today's text, we see Jesus sentenced to death for us by Pilate. Now keep in mind that this is not man's plan. This is God's plan. So if if you're visiting here at Seoul, we pick a book of the Bible, we walk through it. Right now we're finishing Mark, and it's timing perfectly as we come up to Easter. And so Let me recap. Jesus had been on trial two weeks ago. We looked at Jesus on trial before the Jewish council. Last week, we saw Peter's denial of Jesus, which was going on at the same time as Jesus' trial before the religious leaders. So today, what we're doing now is we pick up with Jesus before Pilate, a Roman official over Judea. Now, let's not miss something about this that we can easily miss as we take several weeks to study this, all this happens simply in a matter of hours. The expediency of this event is remarkable. Jesus would actually face six different hearings, three before the Jewish leaders, Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin, and then three before the Roman leaders, Pilate, Herod, and then back to Pilate again. All in a matter of hours, and then he's put to death. So, Let's pick it up where we left off from last week. Go to Mark chapter 15, verses 1 to 5. 15, you can follow along or you can watch on the screen. I'm going to start with a running commentary, if you'll let me, on our passage this morning. So here we go. Very early in the morning, it says. So Romans held court early each day, probably because of the heat. And so it had been probably around, they estimate, 6 a.m. in the morning. Now, chapter 1, though, opens with the abuse of authority the chief priests. The fact that it's plural there is very interesting. It refers to the priestly family of Annas, who actually purchased his office from the Romans. Yeah, he literally bought the chief priest's office. Anyway, he with the elders and the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. And you know the power of the, the, the saying, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So instead of the Sanhedrin using its position and power to give Jesus a fair trial, they used corruption and abuse of their power to condemn him and to get rid of him. Now the Jewish council couldn't carry out the death sentence as they weren't a sovereign people, so they would need Rome for that. And so they had to come up with a charge that would force the Romans to act, and they actually felt that they had a good one. And so they came up with the charge, and the scripture says, so they bound Jesus. Possibly they bound him, they tied him up. Why? Maybe they were afraid of him performing magic to release himself, or maybe it was another way of humiliating him, or maybe it was the common procedure with criminals. But we we do know is that they led him away and then handed him over to Pilate. Now history looks at Pilate, who was the governor of Judea, as a person in charge of the Roman army in the area. He collected the taxes for Rome. He kept on trying to keep peace in Judea. He was the fifth governor of Jerusalem, a post that he held from 27 to 36 AD. Contemporaries of his day describe him, describes him as inflexible, as harsh, as ruthless, and he held the power of life and death over his subjects. And Pilate was also a true politician. He made decisions that would increase his stature in favor with Rome. And the people's desire and well-being were very much secondary to Pilate. He couldn't care less. But, but Pilate was especially careful when he was working with Jewish people because the Jews of that day caused a lot of problems for Rome. And so he knew he would have to be careful with this Jesus case. And so Jesus is brought before Pilate, marking the beginning of this third of his three uh, civil trials that he would face. And as I said, uh, we know the Sanhedrin didn't have the authority to institute capital punishment, but they wanted to have the Romans crucify Jesus. 
Also, the Jewish leaders wanted Jesus to be crucified to have the divine curse of Deuteronomy 21, 23. They wanted that divine curse enacted on him. They wanted this messianic pretender cursed by God. And Jesus does. As we look do our theology in Galatians 3 and Colossians 2, we see that Jesus did bear the curse for us according to the New Testament. But back to the story. So Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And this is where the charge that Jesus claimed to be king of the Jews is used as a political threat against the Roman rule. Mark again highlights the event. He leaves out a lot of detail. Remember, Mark is just trying to get the points to us right away. And the question Mark notes from Pilate is at the heart of the issue. It's the primary concern of Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate's question and concerns were quite different from, than the concerns from the Sanhedrin. Pilate wasn't worried about the religious issues of the Jews. He wasn't worried about blasphemy. He, you know, that's not sufficient for Pilate to execute Jesus. So they used the king bit. That will be threatening to Rome. So no one would be a, because you couldn't be a king or a major leader in the land without the approval of the Roman government. And this was a big deal to the Roman government because many of the uprisings from the various Jewish groups, such as the Zealots, took place to challenge the authority and the rule of Rome. And Jesus' response is simple and straightforward. You have said so. Now again, when we go to the other Gospels, we see that the Gospel of John gives us much more detail of Jesus' interaction with Pilate at this point. Jesus told Pilate and John that his kingdom wasn't of this world, that his kingdom was a heavenly kingdom. And in a sense, he was saying to Pilate, the kingdom I rule over is no threat to your Roman Empire. Not immediately anyway. It will be ultimately, but not yet. That's what Jesus is trying to say. And eventually, the Roman Empire would fade from existence, just as many nations and many kingdoms have faded from existence. And hear me. Pilate doesn't get this. And today, many people don't get this. That Jesus' kingdom will be the only kingdom that lasts. So the G chief priests accused him of many things. And Luke gives us some of the accusations. They accused Jesus of threatening the temple, of being a troublemaker, and being disloyal to Caesar. Jesus says nothing in his defense to all these false accusations. It's the sound of silence. And so again, Pilate asked him, are you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of? But Jesus still made no reply. And Pilate was amazed. See, Pilate wasn't a stupid man. He knew the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders of the Sanhedrin. Verse 10 even says that Pilate knew it was because uh, out of envy that they handed Jesus over to him. Pilate had dealt with these jokers before, and he didn't like them at all. But he was amazed at Jesus' lack of self-defense. And remember, Mark's account is short and to the point. And if you read Luke 23, you see Jesus is then sent to Herod Antipas for questioning, and then following that, he's sent back to Pilate. So once again, the other Gospels give us more detail to what's happening, and Pilate gets upset with Jesus and threatening him, saying, basically, don't you know I have power over you? And Jesus responds, you have no power over me except for what has been given to you. In other words, God is in control of this situation. And this has always been one of those events that, to me, that, that leaves me thinking. What did it mean that Pilate was amazed? I wonder if Pilate was amazed both by and at Jesus. But yet his amazement had no life-changing impact. Like so many throughout history, people can admire Jesus. We can be intrigued with Jesus and yet not be saved by repenting and turning to Jesus by faith. Instead, Pilate bowed his knee to the crowd, as we will find out. Pilate had the title deed to be in control of the verdict, but he lacked the moral and political will to do so. 
In the words of John describing those in authority who refused to identify with Jesus out of fear, Pilate loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And so in the end, as these verses reveal, he abdicated his authority. Which I need to remind all of us, that authority it literally came from God, if we read Romans 13. And so we have to ask ourselves, I, have I, because remember, as we read the scriptures, it's a reflection to us, have I just admired Jesus, or do I trust him? Am I only marginally interested in who Jesus is as a historical figure? Or have I put my faith in him as Lord and God? Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. Of course, we know that Pilate is a crafty politician. He had a custom for releasing prisoners on Jewish feasts and celebrations. It was a political move. It's done to appease the masses. And the Jews got to pick who would be released. And this is where we get an introduction to a man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. So the name Barabbas means son of the father. Bar, son, son of, and Abba, father. His first name is not given to us. We only know what we have about him from the Gospels, which is really not very much, but it's quite to the point. He was known as a criminal. Mark calls him a rebel and a murderer. Matthew calls him notorious. Luke calls him a thief. And many think he was a zealot that caused many insurrections in that day. He was one of these rebels. Again, what we know is that Barabbas was guilty and scheduled to die for his crimes. We know that. But the crowd came up, and they asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priest handed him over, but the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. And again, the crowd's request is not what Pilate expected. Now, there may have been individuals in the crowd who have been Barabbas supporters, serving an and this serves an opportunity for them to shout Barabbas, or maybe it helps serve the religious leaders to get you know, somebody else out of there. There may have just been bystanders who were easily persuaded by the religious leader's agenda. We don't know for sure, but what we do know is that the crowd acted unjustly. The crowd chose Barabbas. And when you consider the kind of person he was, you realize that he was precisely the kind of Messiah most of the Jews were hoping for. Most of the Jews were hoping for a revolutionary. And this highlights a very perverse irony. Somebody who was a military threat to Rome is released, while the one who was no such a threat was condemned to die. In fact, when we look at it, we see that Pilate releases his enemy and at the same time grants protection to that individual who's the enemy of his own friends. Again, Pilate abdicated God's, his God-given authority. Pilate was accountable to God, but he made himself the slave of public opinion and political expediency. And the result that we have is a miscarriage of, of justice. And though Pilate made an apparent effort to secure Jesus' release, he was at the mercy of the crowd, which was at the mercy of the Sanhedrin. And the abuse and abdication of authority is huge, and it's rampant throughout this whole story. And the crowd is really a major motif in the book of Mark, because up to this point, the crowd or the multitude is always in favor of Jesus, supporting Jesus, following Jesus until now, until we see this, uh, along with his disciples, everybody was really happy until they entered Jerusalem, and now the crowd is characterized by hostility. And Pilate then asks, well, what should I do then with the one that you call the king of the Jews? Which is a phenomenal question. 
And it's the question of all time. And it's a question that you and I have to a- ask ourselves and answer. What shall I do with Jesus? What are you going to do with Jesus? What am I going to do with Jesus? Every person who has ever lived will have to face that question. What do we do with Jesus? Do we trust him? Or do we shun him? The characters in our story yell, crucify him. You know, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. Uh, and they shouted all the louder, just crucify him. Like, why? What, what evil did he do? The other gospels show the religious leaders put extra pressure on Pilate to crucify Jesus. The other gospels tell us Pilate tried to wash his hands of the situation. But look at you can't and I can't avoid the question of what do we do with Jesus? Because we all are faced with the same situation Pilate was in. Because neutrality with Jesus is not an option. You can't straddle the fence with, what do you do with Jesus? You are either with Jesus or we're against him. And it's really that simple. And Pilate is at a crossroads, and and what does he do? Well, twice he, he offers to release Jesus the innocent. Pilate knew that Jesus had done nothing wrong. Pilate hated these religious leaders, that they were nothing but a thorn in his side. Pilate wasn't interested at all in fulfilling their bidding and doing their dirty work. And so he tries to use his custom, not his authority, to get Jesus released. Pilate goes so far as to refer to Jesus as as multiple times as the king of kings and the uh, king of the Jews, but it was probably more a dig at the religious leaders who hated Jesus. But then Pilate is still worried about himself. The man in control is worried about himself. He's worried about popular opinion, and the scriptures say, wanting to satisfy the crowd. Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. And this is just a sad, sad situation in response. Pilate didn't want to kill Jesus, but his weak character caved to the pressure of the crowd, insisting that Jesus must die. And of course, as we read Scripture, and I said earlier, it's a mirror to us. And I'm sitting in my office, and the question comes to mind. It says, I wonder what crowds of people do we cave to? What crowds of people do we cave to in our own lives? Do we cave into the crowds at work to keep quiet about Jesus? Do we cave into the crowds at school about openly following Jesus and being a Christian? Do we give into the crowds of popular cultural thought and political correctness as to not offend by the name of Jesus. And I bet we would find ourselves in Pilate's shoes more often than we'd even think if we took a closer look. So Pilate and his authority, in contrast to Jesus and his authority, and the authority of Jesus made everyone uncomfortable. When you think about it, the crowd wanted a Messiah but not a master. They wanted a deliverer, but not a sovereign. They wanted a savior, but not a Lord. And so it is in many of our lives today, because too often even church leaders cave to the crowd and abdicate their authority. Pastors compromise and give the people what they want rather than what the Bible and God says. The flock is then given a watered-down gospel, and therefore one that doesn't even save anymore. The flock is given a crossless and powerless message. And the crowd is allowed to determine the rules rather than being shown what God's Word is. And the culminative result is a church that has become like the world. And in other words, Jesus Christ is betrayed to be crucified again. But this time, it's in the house of his friends. Now, you can say amen or out here, but that's my shot at popular culture and what's going on in the churches today. 
I've always looked at Pilate as a pathetic person. And as I walked through this trial, I, it wasn't a trial before Pilate. It was, it was a trial of Pilate himself. Jesus mentioned him earlier in Luke chapter 13, verse 1, and tells the disciples that on one fierce occasion, Pilate mingled the blood of the Jews who were sacrificing along with their own sacrifices. From two other historical accounts, we know that he foolishly stirred up angst amongst the Jews by being very sacrilegious in many of the things he was doing. And within a few years, he would eventually be removed once and for all from his rule in Jerusalem because of his problematic and incompetent rule. He was a leader who abused his authority. And again, he abused his authority also by abdicating it. The guy knew Jesus was innocent. And for a time, he even tries to defend Jesus to satisfy his own conscience. But he caves into the demands of the crowd, and wanting to satisfy the crowd, he turns Jesus over to be scourged and crucified. Which got me thinking again to say, a person high in government without any spiritual principles is really a pathetic sight. They're like a big ship in heavy seas without any compass, a GPS, or a rudder, and their power surrounds them with traps and temptations. They have power for good and evil, which, if they don't know what they're doing, will bring it, them and the nation into a great, great trouble. And it makes everyone miserable. And so we need to pray for our political leaders, probably now more than ever, as they need grace to keep them out of Satan's clutches. So in this terrible scene of injustice, Jesus, as we've seen, had been left all alone. He's bound with chains, he's falsely charged, maliciously slandered, and he's alone. He's facing a godless ruler with no appreciation for who he was. He's all alone. He's clearly innocent and yet unjustly condemned to die as a criminal. And he'd do so alone. Though sinless, and therefore innocent, he was vilified, and he was beaten mercilessly, and he was alone. And Jesus being all alone is actually a deliberate emphasis by Mark. For you see, he alone could do what he came to do, to, which was to give his life as a ransom for many. The lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world was about to be sacrificed on the unjust altar of human expediency. But this would result in the justice of God being satisfied, so that lamb would die, so that lambs like you and I could be brought into the fold. If you go to the book of Judges, it tells the story of a period when there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their sight of her and his and her own eyes. And the book how, highlights how horrifically wrong things go when people do what's right in their own eyes. Another phrase for that in today's contemporary culture is my truth. And this is particularly true in the closing chapters of 17 to 21 in the book of Judges. But as horrific as, the, as those closing stories are, the one that we find ourselves is even worse. Here there was a king, Herod. There were Jewish rulers, a high priest, a chief priest, there were scribes, there were elders. There was a local Roman governor, Pilate. And still every man did what was right in their own eyes. The true king is rejected. Our text makes this abundantly clear. And in the book of Judges, those responsible for justice failed miserably and maliciously. And Jesus was the victim of deep injustice. And though he was a voluntary victim, those responsible still stand condemned. And each of these characters abuse their authority. Let me just provide a pastoral word at this point. If you have suffered some sort of abuse at the hands of somebody in authority, read this passage over and over again and try to find some sort of comfort. And so did Jesus. 
And truly, he's a sympathetic high priest who is able to identify with us and comfort us in our affliction. Read Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. And tucked between the abuses of authority of the high priest and the Sanhedrin and the abdicated authority of Pilate, we have the amazing authority of Jesus. This chapter contains six references to Jesus as king in verses 2, 9, 12, 18, 26, and 32. Prior to this, though implied, this particular word was not used by Mark with reference to Jesus. So what we now see is that this is actually very significant because the kingdom needs a king, and here he is. Jesus is the ruler, and those whom he rules need to follow him in every way, including in persecution. Go back to Mark 13. Now, again, here we are. We have to realize Mark is telling a story, making it fairly short and concise. He wants his audience who's reading to follow Jesus in light of his story. And he's telling the story that God sent his son to rule as king over the kingdom of God. And with the arrival of Jesus on the scene, we know that the kingdom of God has come. We see that in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. A new era is inaugurated with the arrival of this king, but something needed to happen before the king would be enthroned. And what we do know is that he would first need to be rejected by both Jew and Gentile. He would need to be crucified before being crowned. And Jesus does enter into this true kingship paradoxically enthroned on a cross the king of the Jews. And again, he's left alone at this point. And as we go back in our life lessons, we we realize the very thing that he had been preparing his disciples for, his his crucifixion, was coming to pass. But the disciples, where'd they go? Well, they deserted him. And thankfully, God recorded through the likes of Mark how Jesus faced the cross. And this provides us with what we need in order to, just like Jesus, faithfully suffer as subjects of his kingdom. See, here the king was mistreated and persecuted because of his obedience to divine will. What he was facing was actually a foreshadowing of what Mark's readers would face. So Mark's writing to an audience... And he's preparing them. Hey guys, this is, be prepared. This is the story of Jesus. Be prepared. And in some way, we will face as well. And this passage then becomes a template for how we are to respond. When we embrace the good news that God saves sinners, we also embrace the life that this good news calls us to live. That is a life of following Jesus, which also... When we read scripture, we see it includes suffering. Philippians 1.29 is very clear. So we shouldn't be surprised by this, but implied in this is the ability to suffer well. And Jesus did just that. He suffered well. So when we go back to who Mark is writing to, the original recipients of the gospel... Mark points out very clearly in chapter 13. He says this. Now remember, he's writing then, but he's writing to us now. You have to be on your guard. You'll be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues on account of me. You will stand before the governors and kings as a witness to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, don't worry beforehand about what to say. Jesus, just Say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Jesus was already telling people, hey, this is what's going to happen. And they heard this read. And so they were preparing for their suffering as well. So let me bring it home this morning. 
Jesus would continue to remain silent for about another three more days. But then he's going to rise from the grave with a mighty triumph over his foes, like the hymn says. And even though he remained selectively silent, word would get out and the good news of the gospel would be proclaimed around the globe for years to come, even until today. Secondly, we can look at this event and we can learn some great lessons from the characters in this section. Obviously, the religious leader's hypocrisy, Pilate's fickleness, the crowd's persuasion. But there's actually one quick character that stands out that interests me to this day. And in our pre-huddle, the question was asked, you know, we're supposed to meet up with some people. This is at 9.30 in the morning before you all get here at quarter to 12. Um, so our leader, uh, Steph, said, meet somebody, talk to somebody, and, and, you know, who would you like to do supper with? A historical figure. Mine's Barabbas. Barabbas. You know, he, his character stands out to me, and it, it, it interests me. It's, maybe it's just my head just going crazy, but I've, I've always wondered, am I going to meet Barabbas in heaven? And you're thinking, well, hey, that's a, a really odd thing to say. The guy was a bad dude. Yeah, it's, I think it's odd to think that, but it's a great question to ask. I mean, if anybody would ever get what it, Jesus did for mankind, don't you think Barabbas would have gotten the best picture? So, of course, my imagination goes a little wild. P -p picture this. One day, Barabbas woke up in chains, guilty of rebellion, murder, theft, facing certain death, knowing it was his last day on earth. But by the end of the day, he had been set free from those chains, released as a free man, given a new life, all because of who? Jesus, who took his place. And the release of Barabbas is a wonderful image of God's plan of salvation. The guilty are set free. The innocent one is put to death. See, Barabbas is spared and Jesus is crucified. And really, it's a, a wonderful analogy of the way that God pardons and justifies the ungodly. We deserve the punishment. But a mighty substitute suffered for us. We deserve death and hell, but the Son of God sacrificed himself for us. We all are by nature like Barabbas. We are guilty. We are wicked. We deserve to be condemned. But when we were without hope, Jesus the sinless died for the ungodly. So God, for Jesus' sake, can be both just and justify those of us who believe in Jesus. If anyone could have understood the gospel and what Jesus did for man, it would have to be Barabbas. And if anybody would have gotten the picture of Jesus in my place, it would have to be Barabbas. And I think that's the heart of the gospel. Jesus in my place. Jesus in your place. Again, my mind goes and I often wonder if Barabbas followed Jesus to Golgotha and looked at the cross where he was supposed to hang. I'm a free man. I'm going to see what happens here. And yet the two other thieves watch as the Son of God hung dying in his place and forgiving people at the same time. Like, don't you think that would affect you? It should. It should then and it should today. Because Jesus didn't just die in the place of Barabbas. He died in the place of all of us. He died in my place. He died in your place. He bore the punishment I deserve for my sin. He bore the penalty for my rebellion. He took my death sentence. He died for me. He died for you. And so what will you do with Jesus who died in your place? 
Let me ask, have you turned to him in repentance and faith, trusting him as Lord and Savior? After going through this passage of scripture, I have to ask that question, because if not this morning, we're going to have a quiet moment, and you can do just that, just in the quietness of your own heart, right where you're seated. As a matter of fact, right now, allow me just to pray for you. Let's just bow our heads. What will you do with Jesus? Maybe you're at the point where you're going, yeah, I see him as a historical figure, but not Lord of my life. Maybe today is the day that you invite him in. Allow me to pray for you. God, we confess that we don't always understand your ways. We are easily discouraged when life takes unexpected turns and our carefully laid out plans and dreams come to nothing. And we confess that we're quick to give up when things get difficult. We're quick to question your presence and your power. So, Father, just forgive us our sin. Grant us patience to wait for your good timing. Open our eyes to recognize your leading in our lives, to listen for your gentle whisper when we least expect it. And then give us courage to step out in faith and obedience, trusting in your leading, even when we cannot yet see the outcome. We praise you for your faithful love, and we pray that you would make us worthy to bear your name. Amen. Why don't you stand with me? Please. If you prayed that prayer, tell somebody before you leave today. In ancient times, the one who blessed extended his hands for a blessing. Those receiving a blessing did likewise. Here it is, soul. Soul sanctuary, hear this. The Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And therefore, as you leave this place, go out into the world and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love others as you love yourself. And may God give you the freedom from sin and a heart for justice. May Jesus set you free for love. And may the Holy Spirit go where you go. May he protect you on your way. Now go in peace and live the church. And we'll see you next week. Amen.